Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. On behalf of USAID, Feed the Future, and AgriLinks, I welcome, to, welcome you to our webinar. I'm Shantise McCorkle with AgriLinks. Before we begin, let me orient you to the BlueJeans platform. On the right side of your screen, you'll see the most of your controls. First, please use the chat to introduce yourself and network with colleagues from around the world. To ask questions, please use the Q&A button on the bottom right. Please indicate who your question is for. Feel free to upvote questions you want answered. You can ask questions throughout the webinar, and our Q&A session will be at the end of the webinar. If the presentation is too small on your screen, you can use the slide bar at the bottom of the window to adjust the view. Lastly, we are recording this webinar and will email you the post-event resources as soon as they are available. You can also find the resources at agrilinks.org when they're ready. Thank you for your attention. And I'll now pass it to Chris Hillburner from USAID. Thank you, Shantis, and welcome to everyone who's able to join us today uh, for this webinar. Uh, my name is Chris Hilbrenner, and I lead the Analysis and Learning Division within USAID's Bureau for Resilience and Food Security. We've had multiple shocks at a global level since 2019, and these have had a substantial impact on well-being. For example, in 2020, we saw the first increase in global poverty in more than two decades. But there's been little analysis on the impacts of these shocks at a national level and little unpacking of the different pathways through which these impacts have occurred. So since 2020, we have been working closely with other donors, including the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the UK's Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, alongside the International Food Policy Research Institute to make a contribution to filling this gap. Our first efforts focused on understanding the impacts of the COVID pandemic. And then more recently, we shifted to exploring the impacts of high global commodity prices and potential response options. These analyses have played an important role in driving the location and sectoral focus of USAID food security investments over the last three years. So today, my colleagues, Xin Shen Biao and Jane who are both senior research fellows at the International Food Policy Research Institute, will present the latest chapter in this analysis. Here, we aim to step back and look at the collective impact of global shocks that have occurred since 2019. How have these shocks changed the poverty, hunger, and diet landscape? How and why have these impacts varied across country contexts? And how might future shocks like a potential global economic slowdown in 2023, further compound the impacts we've seen to date. So I'll now hand the microphone over to presentation. After they're done, we'll continue the discussion with a moderated Q&A led by Amy Davies, the Director of Policy Analysis and Engagement within the RFS Bureau of USAID. So James and Chin Chin, over to you. No, thanks, Chris, um, and uh, and thanks to everyone for attending. Thanks for your time and your and your interest. Um, as Chris said, we're going to give uh, uh, Chin, my colleague Shin Shen and I. We're going to talk about some of the very high level uh, a summary of some of this work that Chris has just described, looking at the impacts of these global of the global crises. And it really is crises. It's, we're looking at um, the impacts of COVID, the impacts of the war in Ukraine, and, and then a possible global slowdown in the economy this year. What are the collective impacts on poverty, hunger, and diets? Um, I think all of us can, can testify that uh, you know, the, the truly phenomenal effect that COVID has had on, on our economies and on our, our own jobs and so on, and I think we've also seen last year the, the impacts of the spike in world prices for fuel, for fertilizer, for food, and how that's affected our own um, cost of living, right? Our own shopping baskets. And that's definitely true in developing countries. And then we still face a lot of global uncertainty, um, uncertainty about where our own economies may be going this year and how the global economy is being disrupted. And that in turn may affect us. And so we're going to look at the combined impacts of these three crises. Um, next, uh, next slide, please. So there are a couple of disclaimers. There, is, there are two things which I should say um, where our study is limited, where, where we are bounded 
in a way. Um, and, and that's to do with what we're covering. And I should say this from the outset. Um, the first is that um, you know, we're not looking at all developing countries. Um, we're going to be looking at 20 low and lower middle income countries, slightly more than the 17 that was in the description of the event. Um, we've added a few more since then, but still a limited set of, of developing countries. You can see in the little map in the bottom middle of the screen um, which countries we're going to be looking at. And there are some significant emissions like, um, like India, for example. Um, we've really focused primarily on the Feed the Future countries. And I think we've got a pretty good representation of, of developing countries, but certainly not complete coverage. So that's our first limitation. What we're going to do is we're going to use um, we're going to use models to measure the impacts of these global crises. And models are very useful for us to do this because it allows us to look at the broader implications of a shock, but also isolate each one of these crises separately so that we can identify, as Chris said, what the uh, what each crisis contribution has been. Um, and again, of course, that's with considerable measured with error. Um, I think is a, is 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 generous. Um, we're going to be looking at the impacts of COVID. We're going to be looking at the impacts and the spike in world prices that happened last year. And like I said, we're going to consider the possible impacts of a global slowdown in 2023 in a very stylized way, because of course now we're looking into the future and no one can tell the future perfectly. Um, we're going to look at three different scenarios. We're going to look at what's what's been the impact of COVID on economies. And here we're talking not just about the actual um, pandemic itself, but but the effects of the pandemic as, as may materialize through policy. So think of social distancing, the lockdowns that we all remember from 2020. And you can see on the right hand on the left on the right hand side at the top, um, some of the um, some of the impacts that COVID has had on national GDP, for example, or GDP in agriculture, industry, and services. So this figure at the top is showing us the annual growth rates for, um, for the overall effect on the economy, what we've called gross or national GDP, and then agriculture, industry, and services. And the gray bar, right, the 2.6% on the left-hand side, um, that's what we expected um, the 20 countries that we're looking at, what we expected them to grow at in terms of national of GDP per capita. So we expected GDP per capita in these countries to grow at 2.6% based on what we saw these, these economies doing in 2017 to 2019. So coming into the, the, the COVID and Ukraine crisis period, we would have expected a 2.6% growth rate. The gray bar is telling us what, what actually happened in 2020. Sorry, it's been cut off slightly. The gray bar is what happened um, in 2020. And you can see clearly that there was a sharp reversal, that instead of growing at 2.6% per year, in, in per year um, countries actually, um, their growth declined in 2020 by 3.2%. So a very sharp reversal, about a 5% contraction, or over almost 6% contraction in economies um, during that year, substantial. There are a couple of other things I wanted to point out in this graph. The, the first is quite obvious that actually the decline, the contraction of these economies really was driven by industry and services. And to some extent that reflects the, the social distancing policies that we all know really affected urban, urban sectors, industrial sectors, and particularly service sectors. Think restaurants and hotels and tourism and so on. The, third, the second thing I want to emphasize is agriculture, because by comparison, agriculture actually did relatively well in 2020, that it proved to be quite resilient. Uh, we expected it in these 20 countries to grow at 0.3% based on pre-crisis trends, and during 2020, it grew at 0.3%. Now, there are a couple of things I should say about that. Firstly, um, we know that many people escaped the pandemic or tried to by, um, by leaving urban areas and moving to rural areas. There is anecdotal evidence that that took place. Um, the second thing is that, you know, to some extent, the agricultural seasons in many countries were already rolling as COVID, took, um, COVID started. And we started to worry about what the, what the impact would be, not necessarily on the current season, but on the next season. And so we did see a decline in agriculture of 2% in 2021. That's the brown box, the, the brown bar. Um, while we were watching other parts of the economy begin to slowly recover, right? If services started to grow again. Industries uh, contractions almost stopped in 2021, but agriculture, um, uh, agriculture started to decline. And there are some other factors that may be contributing to that that we're not looking at, and I'll come back to those in a minute.
So that's the first shock. We're going to be modeling what's been, what was the impact on poverty, on food security of the slowdown in, uh, in global economic growth, the sharp contraction. The second thing is we're going to look at what happened to um, what, what happened as a result of those rising world food, fuel, and fertilizer prices in 2022. And you can see on the bottom uh, right-hand side of the screen some changes in real-world prices during 2019 to 2022. Sorry, nominal world prices. And there are a couple of things to note here. The gray bars are actually what was happening to prices before the middle of 2021 when we started to see other prices rising. And the key thing here is that prices were already beginning to increase um, even before uh, the war in Ukraine, even before some of the restrictions on trade started to kick in in mid-2021. Um, but certainly, what happened between June uh, 2021 and April 2022 um, was a substantial increase, acceleration in that increase in prices. And that's what the green boxes are telling us. So if you look at fertilizer prices, for example, most of the 285% increase in fertilizer prices over this period happened during that nine-month window. Part of it was driven by trade restrictions, think China banning exports of fertilizers. Part of it was also due to Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the disruptive effect that that had on global markets. So, the second, so certainly the second thing to note is that most of that increase happened in 2022 or in the few months and towards the end of 2021. And then the final thing to note is that you know, prices have started to ease somewhat. They have started to come down. You can look at fertilizer prices down only 163% higher than they were in 2019 by, by the end of last year. Um, so still substantially higher than they were uh, going into COVID, um, but certainly the pressure has started to ease. So we're going to be modeling the impact of that overall increase in, in world prices by the end of 2022. So the little brown diamonds, that's going to be a shock that we're going to impose on the models at the, in that 2022 year. And then finally, the third thing we're going to look at is this sort of what if. What if in 2023, um, there is a global economic slowdown, and that leads to weaker export prices, lower export prices for, for developing countries because global demand is weakening, which is certainly something we're seeing, um, and then also higher import prices, perhaps because the dollar has strengthened, um, perhaps because there are continued disruptions in, um, in supply chains and so on. We're going to model a fairly modest, um, because we don't know what's actually going to happen this year, um, and we don't want to over, um, overdo things, we're going to modest a, a model a fairly modest um, deterioration in what we call countries' terms of trade, which are these falling export prices, the, the dollars countries earn, and higher import prices, the dollars countries spend. And that's going to put countries in a more tough um, uh, balance of payments position that's going to lead to changes in exchange rates and knock-on effects on the broader economy. So what are these models that we're using? I should just mention, I'm not going to go into a lot of details, but we're using um, what we call FARMS, which is uh, IFPRI's foresight and rapid response modeling system. And the specific model that we're using within FARMS is called RIAPA. And I'm not going to go into details, but there are two things you should know about RIAPA. The first is that it is economy-wide which means that although we're looking at impacts in particular sectors or for, for particular products, we're using this model to then um, track the spillover or knock-on effects of these shocks, not just for the direct sectors directly affected, but for the broader economy as a whole. The second thing you should know about um, RIAPA is that it, it captures the, 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 the population. There are people inside RIAPA, the workers, the households, and so on. And we link these models back to the household survey, so we can track everyone who's part of those surveys. And that allows us to keep track of things like changes in households' poverty status, or changes in the prevalence of undernourishment, or diet quality at the household level. And so, um, and so this is a, a fairly unique tool that allows us to trace impacts on the economy, as well as impacts on people at the same time. Now, when I started the slide, I said there were two caveats. There were two limitations. Um, the first was that we're not covering every country. The second is that we're not capturing every crisis um, that these countries have faced. So we're not capturing, and this is a, this is a, a, a big um, uh, assumption, we are not capturing the impacts of, say, climate shocks. Think about the droughts in the Horn of Africa, which have been very pronounced and affected very clear population groups within countries like Ethiopia and Kenya. And we're also not capturing the impacts of conflict, um, which are clearly also in places like Ethiopia have been very much um, at the forefront of what's been happening in countries 
um, over, the last, uh, over the last couple of years. So we are just looking at COVID, the impacts of higher prices in 2022, and a possible economic slowdown in 2023. Um, that's a big caveat, but I think still useful for us to understand what the impacts of these concurrent crises have been. Next slide, please. So before I show you the results, I think I just want to sort of give you um, a quick overview of how to interpret the results that we get for each and every country. And so we're going to, I'm just going to quickly walk you through in some detail the, uh, the results that we've got from Kenya. Um, and then after that, we're just going to look at all the countries side by side. So on the left hand side, um, we've got uh, the modeled impacts of um, of uh, in changes in growth, uh, GDP growth. And you can see very much that same kind of figure um, that we looked at on the previous slide, changes in agri annual per capita GDP growth rates, very similar to what we saw on the previous slide, but this time just for Kenya. And again, you can see the black bars are telling us what we thought Kenya would grow at based on its pre-COVID uh, growth trends, so about 3% per year. But in 2020, because of COVID, there was a sharp reversal in GDP growth. GDP contracted by 1.5%. In 2021, we saw faster than normal growth as Kenya's economy started to recover. So it contracted, and then it grew faster from a smaller base in 2021. Then the recovery period in 2022 slowed down, so still growing faster than trend, but a much, at a much slower, um, much closer rate, 3.4% instead of 3%. And then in 2023, recovery continued, um, but as you will see, somewhat hampered by the, um, by, by the possible slowdown in the global economy. So this is what's happening to GDP growth rates. If you look in the middle of this slide, you'll see changes in incomes or total GDP at a level, right? So not the growth rate, but the level of GDP per capita. And that's what you can see in the figure. So GDP per capita in 2019 in Kenya was about $1,600. And again, the black bar is what we would have expected without the crises having occurred, a steady upward trend towards about $1,800 at the end of 2023. The gray bars are telling us what the impact was when we take the crises into account, and these are modeled outcomes. Um, and so you can see that, although keyed off of World Bank uh, growth data, sort of observed growth data from WDI, and you can see here how, yes, the growth rates recovered in 2021, but that was not enough to offset the sharp decline that happened in 2020. And so even though the growth rates have come back and the economy is continuing to grow at the same rate, it has lost a year's worth of growth, roughly a year's worth of growth. And so that gap persists. There's some convergence, but it's unlikely Kenya will ever recover um, you know, it'll never be back at the level of GDP per capita that we would expect it to be had there not been a crisis, right? So the economy's growth process hasn't been completely undermined, but it has definitely been slowed down. And that has implications for poverty on the right-hand side. You can see here that um, as a result, uh, so we've got, again, the black bar. This is the population, the poor population, not the poverty rate, but the poor population. And you can see that the black bar in the figure suggested that poverty would decline from about 13.3 million people um, living below the $2.15 poverty line down to about 11.9 million people um, by the end of 2023. That was our expectation. But you can see how COVID, including the recovery period, uh, led to a sharp increase in, the, in the, the number of poor people in Kenya, particularly during 2020 and persistent um, deviation from the baseline um, all the way through to the end of 2023. And then in 2022, as prices spiked, we saw that recovery period stall. And actually, um, poverty stopped declining in 2022 as a result of the increase in prices. Um, but then continue to decline as prices have eased in, in 2023 or towards the end of 2022. Um, but if there is a global slowdown, and again, this is a big if, we don't know what form it will take or if, if it will, um, uh, whether it will be a recession or just a slowdown, et cetera. But if there is a slowdown and a deterioration in countries' uh, trade positions, we would expect um, poverty to again stall. So that by the end of 2023, by the end of this year, you know, poverty would, the poor population in, in Kenya would be at around about 13.2 million people. That's about a 1.3 million, that means about 1.3 million more Kenyans will be living in poverty by the end of this year as a result of these three crises than what we had expected 
before the, the crises started. And so that's actually how we're going to present the results in the next slides, is we're gonna look at the end of 2022 or the end of 2023, and we're going to break down how much of the increase in poverty, in hunger, in diet, um, diet quality, how much of that decrease um, has, is due to um, COVID, the gap between the black and the green lines, how much has been caused by the spike in world prices, the gap between green and brown lines, and then how much could be, might be caused by a possible global slowdown between brown and gray lines. And those are going to be the bars that we show on the next slide. Next slide, please. So here we have changes in GDP. Um, and on the right-hand side, there is a figure which is showing the percentage decline in national GDP, the figure on the left, right? And how much has been caused by COVID, the green box, how much was caused by the world price spikes in 2022, the brown box, and how much is caused by a possible global slowdown. Um, and then on the right-hand side, we've got agri-food system GDP. So this is agriculture, primary agriculture, but also the processing, the trading, the transporting of food and agricultural goods, as well as those restaurants and hotels and other food service sectors as well, all combined. And there are a couple of things, a couple of things, and then, and then we've got results for each of the 20 countries um, shown. These are modeled impacts again. Um, a couple of things really jump out. The first is clearly that the size of the impacts varies um, considerably across countries. And so it's really important to look at the impacts of crises country by country. Um, so you can see from Cambodia, a minus 3% contraction in national GDP down to say a country like Kenya with a 0.6% decline in national GDP as a result of these crises um, by the end of 2023. Um, clearly, the green boxes dominate, and that tells us that it really was COVID that has led to that permanent deviation in GDP. Um, it's been the persistent effect in, in GDP. It dominates. Overall, it accounts in the pie chart for about 87% of the decline in GDP, with the spike in world prices about 7%, and the global contraction only about 6% of the overall decline. Um, the, um, what you can see in the case of Cambodia, for example, is, a, is by far the largest impact of the 20 countries that we're looking at. And that's really driven by, by, by um, the fact that, you know, going into COVID, um, Cambodia was growing at about 4.7% per year. In 2020, there was a complete reversal of that growth trend with the economy contracting by 4.4%. But that's about an eight, nine percent decline in GDP relative to where we thought the country would be. Um, at the same time, Cambodia in 2021 had a fairly modest recovery in terms of GDP growth, um, only about 0.5 percent growth in 2021. So, so really that gap between where we thought we would be and where we were after COVID is very large and persistent in the case of Cambodia. Um, in Mali, we also saw a big decline, not so much in, well, certainly in national GDP, minus 2.2%, but a very large impact in agri-food system GDP, 2.6% on the right-hand side. And this is because in the case of Mali, unlike in many other countries, as we saw, agriculture wasn't robust in 2020. Malian agriculture actually declined quite substantially in 2020. Um, and it's possible that we're capturing some of the effects, not just of COVID, um, but also conflict and other factors that may have led to that decline in agriculture. Overall though, impacts on agri-food systems are relatively smaller than they were in um, than the impacts on the overall economy. And that is because agriculture was fairly robust, continued to grow as we saw on that first slide during the COVID period. Um, next slide, please. So that was what was happening to economies and relatively small effects um, uh, overall, um, given the size of the, the crisis and the, the far reaching effects of COVID. Now we're gonna look at the impacts on poverty, hunger and diets on each of the next three slides. Clearly, uh, again, we're following the same process here. Instead of having declines in national GDP, the figure on the right is showing the percentage point increase in the poverty rate. So in the case of Bangladesh, Poverty by the end of 2023 is 1.7 percentage points higher than it would have been without the crises, right? 1.7% of Bangladesh's population is li now living below the $2.15 uh, $2 poverty line um, than we would have expected without the crises. And these little boxes on the right-hand side are translating those changes in poverty rates into changes in the number of poor people. 
by the end of 2022, so based on what we've already seen, and then also by the end of 2023, if we factor in a possible global slowdown. Clearly, we can see across these figures that poverty is higher in all of the countries that we've looked at as a result of these crises. All of these percentage point increases are positive. Um, overall, if we sum up across all the countries, there are about 26 million more poor people by the end of, of 2022 um, as a result of COVID and that spike in world prices. Um, clearly, COVID is again the main driver, and that's because, um, because of the impacts of COVID on, on household incomes um, and disruptions in supply chains and just a substantial decline in GDP like we saw in the previous uh, slide. But Unlike on the previous slide, where we saw the spike in world prices accounting for only 7% of the increase in GDP, the spike in world prices in 2022 is a much larger contributor to the increase in poverty, 22% of the overall increase in poverty. Um, and that's because those world price spikes directly affected um, not just incomes, but actually the cost of living, the cost of food um, for many households. And food is obviously a key component of poor households' consumption baskets. And so in a way, the spike in world prices was a more direct um, uh, impact on, uh, on poverty than, say, it was on, um, on, on national GDP or national incomes overall. Uh, where the impacts from COVID were more heavily affecting urban and also non-poor households as well. Um, the, uh, uh, what you can see overall is that COVID is still the major driver, um, but the impact of a possible slowdown in 2023 is very real. Um, that uh, you know, it would possibly even be larger, even a modest slowdown that deteriorates countries' trade positions could lead to a significant increase in poverty. And once we factor in that possible slowdown, the increase in the, global, in the poor population across these 20 countries could rise to 29 million people, um, with, with the slowdown accounting for about a quarter of that. Finally, I should just, uh, I should, uh, the, the little gray pie chart on the left-hand side is breaking down that increase in, in uh, the poor population across rural and urban areas. Certainly, this is not, a, um, this is uh, an impact that is affecting the whole population, both rural and urban. The impacts on rural populations are larger, in part because obviously rural populations in these 20 countries tend to be larger, and therefore sort of a larger population to be affected. But there was also, particularly with the spike in global prices and the deterioration in the glo in, uh, possible global slowdown, those are more likely to hit rural households harder, in part because um, uh, many countries export primary agricultural products and we've seen those uh, spike in world prices affecting um, food costs, uh, which affect the poor disproportionately. Next slide, please. Now we look at hunger, and here we're looking at the prevalence of undernourishment, sort of what share of the population is actually meeting a minimum calorie threshold um, as defined by the FAO. And again, this uh, slide follows the same format as the previous one, but now we're looking instead of poverty rates, but at the prevalence of undernourishment. So in Bangladesh, a two percentage point increase in, um, in the share of the population that are now considered undernourished. Very similar to the poverty impacts in some ways, although the impacts on countries varies considerably. Um, overall, if you look across the 20 countries, about a 15 million um, increase in the population that are undernourished across the 20 countries. Um, fairly large impacts on countries like, um, like Mali, for example. And remember, Mali was a country whose food system was particularly badly affected in 2020. And so it's not surprising then that this is reflected, um, you know, changes in the production of staple food crops, calorie heavy um, food, food supply was severely disrupted. And so we start to see countries like Mali affected um, uh, quite badly. Rwanda was also quite badly affected, um, even though the impacts on poverty were somewhat smaller. And that's, that's to some extent reflects the importance of say fertilizers for staple food production in Rwanda. Um, as higher fertilizer prices, um, you know, reduce demand and use of fertilizer, this then affects the, uh, the level of um, food production in the country and then di more directly affects undernourishment than say it does for, for poverty. Um, again, we see uh, the spike in world prices uh, contributing about a quarter of this overall increase in undernourishment and a possible slowdown another quarter, but still COVID dominates and, um, and the impacts are still um, uh, sort of mostly concentrated in rural areas. Next slide, please. 
The final outcome that we're going to look at is, uh, is diet quality. And we're measuring diet quality here using something that we call the Reference Diet Deprivation Index, or the RED Index. And this is, this is a very useful index or indicator because it allows us to track household level consumption across major food groups. Think staples and, and protein and so on. Um, and so we're tracking how far away households' expenditures are from what we think they should be spending in each of these different six uh, food groups. And we're measuring the cumulative gap across those six food groups. Um, basically, what it means is that when the red index um, increases, households are moving further away. They're becoming more deprived. They're moving further away from that reference diet. And the reference diet we're using is the Eat Lancet diet. Um, which is a, an Eat Lancet healthy diet. Um, we could just as easily use countries' own, well, not just as easily, we could use countries' own reference diets in places where they exist, but for now, we're just using the same Eat Lancet diet, but these diets are costed based on local prices, local national prices. And what you can see from the figure, and these are changes in the, in, in the, in the red index, so we can't turn these into people, but what we can see in the case of Bangladesh is that the red index um, declines by or worse increases by one one percentage point. That means that the the gap between collective gap between all households and that reference diet has increased by about one percent. Um, and what we can see here is that those impacts on diets on the deprivation index is positive. Deprivation is rising in all 20 of the countries. Again, that decline in income that was caused by COVID dominates. It accounts for about half of the increase, so over half of the increase. Um, but that spike in world prices also raised the cost of the, the reference diet, the healthy diet, and reduced incomes for, for, for many households. And so that also contributed to a, de a deterioration in diets as well. But again, a lot of um, variation. The variation very much depends on um, how on, we've got a common diet, but very much depends on what households in each country are actually consuming, right? And the size of the gap, where are their, de um, their um, where are the diet inadequacies largest within a particular country? So very country specific outcome. Let's go to the last slide, please. So we've, we've had a bit of a whirlwind tour across all these different outcome areas and across all the different countries. And so let me just try and give you a broad summary. Um, and, and it's quite difficult to do. What we have seen across, uh, across all the countries is that these compounding effects of these three crises that we've looked at, and particularly COVID and the world price spike last year, have led to a significant deterioration in poverty and food insecurity um, across all of the countries that we looked at, all the low and lower middle income countries that we looked at. On the right-hand side is a quick, um, some headline summaries, 29 million more poor people pushed into poverty in these 20 countries, um, possibly by the end of this year, um, with most of that having already occurred because of COVID and the world price spike. Another 15 million people um, becoming undernourished as a result of these crises. So there are a couple of conclusions or a couple of things that I want to draw your attention to. The first, I think that is important, is that you know, we saw that agriculture in many ways played a buffer role, certainly during COVID um, in, in 2020. We saw agriculture continuing to grow or holding its own, despite the fact that, that industry and services went into contraction. But we did start to see a decline in agriculture in 2020 in these 20 countries, and it does raise questions about what might have been driving that. Was it conflict and, and climate, which we haven't looked at, or are we seeing the effects of higher fertilizer prices affecting the, the next planting season after COVID hit. Um, I think there's some more work that needs to be done there, but, but certainly a key role that agriculture played in becoming almost a national safety net uh, from an economic perspective. The second uh, thing, and there are only two, the first is agriculture, the second, agriculture's resilience. Um, the second is that it's very difficult to generalize. It's difficult to generalize across countries. We saw very different sized impacts um, across the different countries. Um, and so, yes, things may be getting worse in, in a particular country, but they might be getting so much worse, um, more worse in countries, um, in, in other countries. And the second thing, and I think this is key, is that it's quite difficult to generalize across outcome indicators, that an increase, the countries that had big increases in poverty were not necessarily the ones that saw big increases in hunger, or as big increases in hunger, or the worst increases in diet deprivation. Um, it's very, very country specific. And to some extent, that speaks to why we think all three of these outcomes are valid policy, um, uh, policy goals um, or important development outcome indicators that uh, you know, changes in hunger do not directly translate into changes in poverty 
And targeting poverty as a policy outcome doesn't necessarily mean that you're targeting uh, diet quality at the same time. So to come back to our overarching question, which is, you know, how far, how much have we been set back um, as a result of these compounding crises? What we find across the individual countries is that for the most part, countries have been set back two to three years um, worth of poverty reduction. That, they've, that countries that were growing suddenly faced very strong headwinds that pushed them back two to three years. And although their economies are beginning to reduce poverty again, they're never going to be able to um, recover, very unlikely to recover um, and get back to where we'd hoped they would be. Um, and so very much puts pressure on the 2020 sustainable development goals and so on, whether or not those targets are achievable, they're gonna be a lot more difficult to achieve as a result of these compounding crises. Um, what you can see in this very bottom figure here is the cumulative number of poor people across all 20 countries that we've looked at. And, and you can see, you know, we hadn't expected much poverty reduction um, across all 20 countries. Um, there was some, but not much. That's the black line. But you can see how um, the, uh, the COVID and the Ukraine, um, the, the world price spikes and global slowdown have really made um, getting back to that level of poverty almost in, in, uh, that we had hoped for um, almost in, impossible. If we take out, uh, this, this figure is very much dominated by the DRC and by Nigeria, the countries with the two largest populations in our group. Um, otherwise, we would see a, a decline in poverty and countries today would be about where they were, where we had hoped they would be in 2019. Um, so very much time lost, years lost of development. And so let me just end with you know a couple of things that I would take home from this in terms of uh, direction for further policy and 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 um, investment, I guess. The first is you can see from the analysis just how important agriculture has been, both as a a social safety net or a national safety net, but also how important impacts on on agriculture and food systems have for poverty and food security. And then the second thing is that, you know, these, um, the impacts of the crises, we may start to feel like they're in the rear view mirror, but the effects of these crises are really going to stay with us. They're going to persist. And so this really does call for sort of greater, greater investments or greater attention being paid to agriculture and food systems um, going forward, even though many of the crises, you know, may have affect, may have had largest impacts outside of agriculture. Thanks very much. Thank you, James. Um, I think that was an excellent presentation, and I know we've already got quite uh, quite a few questions coming in. So again, just a reminder to to folks: please put your questions in the Q and A tab. We are collecting those. Um, some may be answered in the chat, uh, and others we will pose to both James and Chen Chen. So let's get started. Um, so, uh, first, a question around um, fertilizer use and smallholder farmers. Um, within the global price impacts, how important were the fertilizer price shocks, especially given that smallholders in many African countries don't use much fertilizer? It's an excellent question. It's actually something we spent quite a bit of time poring over as we were modeling the impacts of the Ukraine crisis. So not only was there an increase in fertilizer prices, which made it um, much more production costs went up for a lot of smallholder farmers, um, but it also caused some farmers to stop using fertilizer. And we tried to estimate what that impact might be based on what we know about farmers' responsiveness to increases in prices. Um, and, so, and so we modeled that impact. And we did take into account for a country that uses no fertilizer, obviously the impact, which is no country, but no fertilizer, the impacts of the rising fertilizer prices would be very, would be negligible, zero. Um, but, and obviously countries that have higher adoption rates, smallholder farmers that, that use more fertilizer are more exposed to that increase. And we did try and take that into account. Um, this is where we're particularly worried about what the delayed effects would be that, um, you know, in the begin with, it manifests as higher production costs. In some countries, it already purchased fertilizer, and so we're already able to use the fertilizer in 2022. We may start to see impacts towards the end of last year and coming into this year of the current um, harvest, and then we would really start to see smallholder farmers feeling the full brunt of that spike. We tried to take some into account, but certainly... Um, we'll need the data and the evidence to actually come in to better inform those scenarios. A, a good question. Uh, 
Great, thanks. Um, and just, I think I think you answered this, James, but just to um, reiterate for the group, um, can you confirm that the agri-food systems that you looked at is not only agriculture, um, as you stated at the start, it's the whole system production to consumption? Exactly. So it's primary agriculture, crops, livestock, forestry, and fisheries, as well as the processing, the trading, the transporting, the food services, and so on. So a much broader view um, of the agri-food system than just farming or agriculture itself. Great. Um, next question. Did you look at the impacts based on age or gender? And do you know how uh, the impacts differ across these groups? Again, and, and, and we do actually have some estimates on what the impacts have been um, disaggregated by sex. Um, what's interesting, um, and I'm going to try and summarize them, I really should have presented them, but um, to some extent the overall effect is about 50-50. It's very much proportional to, to the population. And so in a sense you would say, well, not particularly interesting. But actually if you look at the different crises, they had very different gender implications. So for example, COVID, disproportionately affected men to some extent because those sectors that were most affected by COVID were the industries and the services um, where men tend to sort of have a slightly higher representation in terms of the workforce. The impacts of the higher um, Ukraine, um, the higher prices because of the war in Ukraine and, and other factors, that really affected women to some extent because it was more heavily affecting food systems where um, women's participation is disproportionately higher than you would expect. Although it's come out as being a bit of a wash, um, certainly the, when you look at a specific crisis, it, it very much has a, gi a gender dimension to it. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks. Um, I want to go back a little bit. Um, I think there are more questions related to, um, to how we looked at agri-food systems and GDP. So I know uh, there were slides, um, there was a slide that looked at ag GDP being on farm only, um, but, but later analysis that uses ag GDP plus, which is on farm and off farm. Um, so just asking um, James, you or Shen Shen, um, does this suggest that the impacts were really on the off farm parts of the food system? Chen, I don't know if you want to answer that. Otherwise, I can. I, I think for different crises, uh, the impact on agriculture versus off farm of agri-food system uh, different. So like COVID, the impact on the primary agriculture is much smaller. Yeah, so so the, 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 the reason is that most of uh, uh, policies and interventions are related to uh, non-agriculture. So most of country agriculture actually is exempt from all the lockdown, all of this is indirect effect to agriculture. However, if we move on to the uh, food price, food crisis, and also to the slowdown economy, it can have a trickle down impact on uh, domestic uh, agriculture prices. Actually, there's a gain and there's loser. So for like the Egypt, is heavily depend on import of uh, uh, wheat. So the rising food prices may benefit the wheat grower, that small part of agriculture, but will maybe uh, hurt the entire agriculture because they have to compete results uh, with other agriculture. So generally speaking, agriculture impact is smaller uh, on farmer than off farmer. A really important distinction. Um, we have a couple of questions related to the country selection um, for the analysis. So could you explain a bit why um, no LAC countries uh, were considered for this study? Yes, well, and so therefore I need to start with an apology and say I'm sorry that there are not more LAC countries um, in the sample. Again, we were a little bit biased by the uh, countries that are the focus countries for Feed the Future. Um, and there are two LAC countries, Guatemala and Honduras, that are in the Feed the Future focus country set, and we really should have included them. Um, part of it is to do with, um, at the time when the crises hit, 
uh, Guatemala and Honduras had, had sort of gone through a process of improving all their statistics. And so we had to make a difficult choice between whether we stop and get those two countries up, up and running um, before we carried on, or did we move as quickly as we could to, to work with the countries that we already had. Rest assured, we will be adding Guatemala and Honduras and, 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 and some other countries um, in the coming months. Um, but again, it just takes us a little bit of time to get those models polished and back up and running now that there is new data available. Um, but, but yes, I saw there was a question around sort of the, the 10 years of development last in, in, Latin, in Central America, and I think that's very much true. And that's the same for Guatemala, I mean, for, for, for uh, Nigeria, for example, countries that were growing very slowly and hardly making any progress going into COVID, they're almost facing a permanent setback that's going to take decades to, to, to recoup. So, um, so certainly Central America and, and countries like Nigeria and DRC and, and others have a, and um, yep, I forget the other one, Madagascar. Um, no, not Madagascar, sorry, uh, are going to face a, a significant uphill battle. Sudan was the country I was thinking. Thanks. Thanks, James. Um, we have another question about the, the global price impacts and where we are with actuals. Is it possible yet to do any ground truthing of what has actually happened to production in 2021-2022. Um, high, higher food prices incentive, a supply, incentivize a supply response, higher inputs and transport drag that response down. But um, we're not yet sure what the net effect is. This, this is from Derek, my, my dear colleague. Um, yeah, I think, you know, there is, it, the, the, the jury is out to some extent. And I think there are a couple of things that I would, I would say to, to this. It is true that, you know, in, in rural areas, higher prices can raise the, um, the, the incomes of farmers, although we need to see whether or not farmers are net producers or net sellers, I mean, net, net, net consumers. And in many cases, even smallholder farmers might be net consumers, in which case on net, they would actually be hurt by, by higher prices. The second thing is that more and more farmers today are, are more closely engaged with markets. And so what they produce and what they consume are not necessarily the same thing. And so, you know, half, even in Africa, half of, half of the rural population live within an hour of a city of 50,000 or more and are engaged in markets. Um, and so the net effect is quite complicated now than it used to be even 10 years ago with the food price crisis. Um, and so, and so, and then, and then finally, obviously, the impacts on poverty are not just looking at the rural poor, but also the urban poor, who very much are the net consumers. So I think we need to dig a little bit more deeply into looking at what our data quality is. And I know Derek is doing exactly this. The second thing I would say is that we saw COVID actually dominates. And so it's very difficult to sort of disentangle, because we've had these concurrent crises, very difficult to disentangle oh, just the impacts of higher world uh, food prices versus the persistent and lingering effects of COVID and the persistent effect it's had on income. It's very difficult for us with these periodic surveys that we do to actually separate out these two things. So it's, it's an interesting hypothesis, Derek, that actually poverty might fall if, if food prices rise. Um, but I think we've got a lot more work to do. And, and as IFPRI employees, it's our job to look deeper into that. So, so we should and we will. Thanks. Thanks, James. I would just add from USAID's perspective that, um, you know, this is not the, the first analysis, as Chris mentioned at the onset, um, that we've done with IFPRI, uh, as well as other analytical partners. And so we also feel like ongoing um, analysis and updates on this is incredibly important, and we'll continue to support that. Um, next question. How was the factor of increased population used in the model? Wouldn't an increase in population cause an increase in the number of people within poverty? Shen Shen, I don't know if you want to answer that or I can. Yes, actually, the, in terms of the modeling, we have a baseline. So in the baseline, the one basically uh, James Shaw is uh, I, uh, as a business as usual train. In the baseline, we consider the recent population growth rate. So it means the growth rate uh, is factored in, in the way uh, we do not consider the uh, shocks impact on population. So it means the population growth is uh, same between the baseline and what we are, we are going to simulate. 
Thank you, Shinshin. Um, another question, how reliable is the underlying data that is used to feed into the model? Um, and is it variable across different countries? Um, it definitely is variable. Um, it's much better than you would think. Um, I think there was a, a book published back in early 2010s called Poor Numbers, which, which um, really critiqued countries' national accounting systems and how they measure production and incomes across different sectors. Um, to some extent, by the time that book was published, the, the systems had already started to improve. And so the data that's coming into the models is very much official national data, but the quality of that national data is getting much, much better. It includes both formal and informal production. It includes both home and marketed consumption. Um, and so it, it, is, uh, it is better than you might think, but it is going to be more variable. Um, you know, developed countries have hundreds of people working on their national accounts. You know, low-income countries like Malawi may have four or five or six, um, and then also have less data to, to work with. So, yeah, we fully recognize the limitations of the data, but it is the same limitations that we would have for poverty measures or for GDP estimates and so on. That very much is, is passed on to the models uh, with all the same caveats that, that apply. Thanks. Yeah, yes, also I like to add it, uh, data for those, uh, for those 20 countries, at least we have some data. That's why we can do analysis. So there are many other uh, countries they desperately uh, deserve a study like South Sudan, like Haiti, but that kind of country, we unfortunately we couldn't have data to do it. Thanks. I, I think you already spoke to part of this question, but just to make sure that we've got the full um, question out there, have you looked at the impacts on structural transformation, notably population changes in rural versus urban areas? Um, so not just population growth, but um, it, but where it sits, as well as shares of ag GDP versus non-ag. Uh, so maybe I, I pick up this question because uh, with uh, USAID help, we also have a parallel study on growth diagnosis for ag food system. So for that study, we focus on relatively longer period, not just short term impact. So for us, structure transformation in the economy, also in the whole ag food system, actually is a result of past decade growth, right? It's not just all of a sudden the structure can change. So how much actually the crisis slow down uh, structure change, uh, slow down uh, transformation? That's that's more difficult question to study because most of uh, the shift from uh, rural to urban and from ag to non-ag need much more other factors, but for example, from uh, global market situation, from domestic uh, market situation, from changing dietary patterns and consumption patterns, yeah. And if I can just add one more thing, I think we can't quite, we would not go so far as to say that the crises have permanently jeopardized the positive structural change and transformation that we were seeing countries face. They have been set back, but many countries have are sort of heading back to being on track again um, and, and progressing as they were b before the crisis. Um, just, just to add that, yeah. Thank you. Um, next question, um, and and I can add a little bit after you all respond to this. Um, so one, I just want to say we're getting a lot of comments about um, how excellent the presentation and and um, this information is. So want to pass that on. Um, so excellent presentation showing the impacts of various shocks on poverty and diets and SDGs. Uh, what is needed or should be done? So what are your recommendations to catch up and prepare us for future shocks? Oh, I would love to be able to pass that to Shen. <laughs> I think I think you know the one thing that we were particularly concerned about as these crises um, uh, hit us one after the other was that, uh, and quite understandably, governments would take their eyes off of agriculture in the food system and redirect their resources towards um, those parts of the economies that were facing the most tremendous um, shocks. So think industry and services and urban populations. 
And I think, um, you know, while that did happen to some extent, I think, you know, the, to some extent, the perverse effect of the spike in world food prices is that it reminded governments quite quickly that actually the food system is key, um, even though COVID mostly affected the non-food system. And so, um, and so to some extent, I don't think we've seen that dramatic shift away um, from agriculture, but we are seeing possibly a slowdown in investment in the sector overall because government's budgets are constrained and debt uh, limits are being hit and crises are looming. Um, and so I think, you know, going forward, what we really need to do is, is remind governments and use, it, use research and analysis and others, other evidence to remind governments that agriculture remains a, a crucial development sector, um, even though it is that buffer and safety net or proved to be that buffer or safety net during COVID. Sorry, Amy, you had can pass over to you. No, that's great. Thank you. I, I just wanted to make a, a couple of comments um, about how we're using this data uh, in our response um, from USAID's perspective. So um, certainly, again, as we've said, this is an update of previous analysis. Um, we also take into consideration um, both analysis we're doing internally, looking at various risk factors, um, looking also at World Bank and other data, but we're really using this to try to figure out um, two key things, I would say. One, where we really need to focus uh, our efforts, um, and then two, what might make the most difference in terms of expanding uh, safety nets and social protection. Um, in those countries and areas most impacted in terms of um, working very specifically on affordability of um, inputs, including fertilizer um, in countries that, that may need it. So it is informing our response and the activities and places we try to prioritize. Obviously a global shock or global shocks like these make it very difficult given that the impacts are quite widespread. But I would say also that we have incorporated uh, some of this into um, our own discussions around Feed the Future target countries um, given the timing. And um, I, you know, so I think we did focus a lot as, as James has said on uh, Feed the Future target countries. Um, but in part, that's because I think we still feel like, by and large, those are the places we need to be. Those are the places where we need to focus. Um, but that's not to say that we alone are, are meeting all of that need. Um, the other thing to keep in mind, and as James has said earlier, um, this analysis so far is not looking or incorporating uh, climate shocks and um, conflict. And so we, we are obviously working um, in close coordination with our humanitarian colleagues as well on, on the response in, in some of those countries. It's really hard to parse out um, some of the impacts in the horn, for example. Um, so I just wanted to, to note that I think we probably have time for uh, one more question. And I thought I saw a question um, uh, just to round this off um, about what some of the data sources were for the study. I know you've talked a lot about the different, the variability in, um, across countries, et cetera. And um, follow up on that, to what extent does the model incorporate informal trade flows? No, it's, it's a great question, and, and there are some blind spots in this analysis because of the data and because of us, because we, we, we're not perfect and we're not thinking about everything. Um, and so it's a great question to end with because I do think we want to stress, you know, things like informal trade, we struggle to measure, and so they're not particularly well captured in the analysis. And so there is a temptation to say this is what the model says and this must be true, or there's a, a temptation to dismiss models outright. The answer is somewhere in between, that the model is one piece of information, as Amy has said, um, and, and it gives us one more sort of data point to use to, to help make decisions, but it's certainly not the definitive final word. And we'll continue to make things better and add new countries and refine the analysis um, as we go forward. Thanks, Amy. Thank you. I think we're right at time. I wanna thank again, James and Shen Shen,
for presenting and answering questions. Um, I hope we got to most people's questions either through the chat or through the discussion. I think the the amount of questions we had coming in just shows um, both um, the interest in continuing to understand the impacts of this unprecedented set of global shocks that we're dealing with, um, and also just how uh, how important it is for those of us in the food security uh, community to understand and try to respond um, as best we can. So again, really appreciate the excellent work from our friends at IFPRI and really appreciate all of you taking time out of your day to join the discussion um, and ask questions. And we will certainly continue to share the materials and bring folks together as we get additional data and information um, in through our ongoing work. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.